Good afternoon, everybody. This is Juan Ocasio for the House of Truth Christian Ministries. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Sunday, May the 7th, 2023. And we are so excited that in the times when and where we're living, we are living in the times of the end, in the last days, if you will, we are excited to keep bringing uh, Bible studies, Bible messages, and time ministry to everyone who wants to hear the word of God, a word of repentance and conversion, and also a message of hope and a way to escape the things that are going to happen in this world. And it's through and by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave his life on the cross about 2,000 years ago in Calvary, on Golgotha, outside the walls of Jerusalem, And he provided the way to not just to be saved from the wrath of God, but also to be saved from our sins and the sins of Adam and Eve and receive eternal life, life eternal by faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. We make echo of the words of the prophet uh, Isaiah, who said, which is written in Isaiah chapter Uh, 62, verse 6, and it reads, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, verse 7, and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. I am a watchman. My name is Juan Ocasio. My name is not important. What is important is that the message of the gospel be preached out, not just out of the walls of Jerusalem alone, but out in every street, in every corner, in every church, in every medium that we can use to spread the gospel, the good news, the good tidings of the kingdom of God in the hands of the only begotten Son of God, that is Jesus, and He's the only way to this to the Father. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no one, no man comes to the Father but by me or through me. Having known these premises and these uh, Bible verses that I recited to you from the Holy Scriptures, and I abide by the Holy Scriptures alone. That's the authority, the final authority of everything we say. We are very confident that this message today will be of great benefit for you. Today's message is keep your faith from shipwreck. Although this message intends to be heard by members of the body of Christ, the body of believers, the brethren, as well known as the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, will be a great opportunity for you to ponder upon these words and it will give you a tool for you to make a decision to believe or not to believe, to have faith or not to have faith in the only begotten Son of God that is Jesus Christ. And with any other preamble, we'll go to the Holy Scriptures. I use the King James Version, and we are going to read first in the Gospel of Matthew two special uh, uh, passages of Scripture. And after that, we go from there. Keep your faith from shipwreck. The first Bible verses we're going to read are found in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And it reads as such. And when he was entered into a ship, that was, we're talking about Jesus Christ, he entered a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the wives. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Verse 27, But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? 
that even the winds and the sea obey him. In this passage of scripture, we see the very event that took in the lives of the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus and the apostles enter into a boat. Remember, the Sea of Galilee is basically a big lake in Israel. It's no more than uh, seven miles by five miles big. So any lake of the Finger Lakes is bigger in surface area than this Sea of Galilee. However, the Sea of Galilee is central to the culture and the livelihood of the Israelites and the people from the area for in, in, in the Sea of Galilee, they are fishes. So there's businesses of fishermen. Uh, the first four disciples of Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishermen under uh, Peter, who owns the business of fishing, as far as we know. Uh, these four men, Jesus, men and fishers, so men of fishermen. Okay, so... We see in this event that Jesus go into the boat along with the disciples. So it must be a, a medium-sized boat. Remember, they were made of wood. They were kind of fragile in the days of storm. So Jesus falls asleep in the boat. And in the middle of the boat, there surges a tempest. A tempest is nothing no other than a water spout or water tornado. And this uh, tempest was of uh, such violence that was generating a lot of strong winds and a lot of strong waves, and it was about to make the ship capsize. It's understandable that the disciples of Jesus, the apostles who became, uh, were in a dire condition, and they wake up Jesus and say, Lord, we perish. And they know they can count on Jesus, for they follow Jesus by faith, not just because of the miracles that Jesus performed, but also for his teachings, that they knew that Jesus was much more than just a rabbi, a teacher. They knew that Jesus was supernatural. They didn't understand how supernatural was the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. But mind this, when they say we perish, perish is different than die, and perish is just cease to exist. Uh, die, anybody can die and come to life according to the words of Jesus, according to the word of, uh, of God. But Jesus rebukes the storm and he silences and steals the wind and the water. There was a great calm. But Jesus also not just rebukes the wind and the sea, he rebukes his own disciples. He asks them, why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? And he says, oh, ye of little faith. So in order to be with Jesus and to be disciples of Jesus, not you only deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him daily. You have to believe in him. Faith comes with belief. We'll talk about that in a moment. But this is the first case where Jesus rebukes a storm. And even the apostles say, what kind of man is this? That he uh, has the power to make the wind and the seas obey him. Mind you, this is the first case of a storm. Let's read the second. The second case is followed, found also in Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, a few uh, chapters down, we're going to read 10 verses from the 22nd to the 32nd verse, Matthew 14, 22 to 32. 14, 22 to 32. And he reads, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples. I mean, he made his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side. Well, he went, he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the she was now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, I'm talking about close to 3 a.m., 3 in the morning, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when, this, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. 
But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sing, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, that is Jesus and Peter, the wind ceased. Verse 33 also says, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, that is Jesus, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Have you noticed that in these two passages of Scripture, we see that there are two separate events in where the disciples were in a storm in the Sea of Galilee, commonly known now as the Lake of Genesaret, but now it is two storms that threatens the lives of the disciples. There's a difference in these two uh, events. The first one, Jesus was in the boat asleep, fast asleep. And he wakes up at the request of his disciples and he rebukes the sea, the winds, and the disciples for their lack of faith. In this case, Jesus, after he fed 5,000 men with bread and fishes, he dismissed the people. Uh, he told the disciples, go, go to the other side of the, of the sea, get in the boat. I have to stay here and pray. And Jesus was praying. It was important for Jesus to pray and to be alone, to commune with the Father. And now there's a storm in which the disciples have no Jesus. They are by themselves and they're fighting a wind that was contrary. If they're supposed to go this way, the wind was blowing opposite, threatening their lives. And the passage of Scripture, chapter 14, said that on the third watch, basically about three in the morning, Jesus is walking on the water and not to go directly to the sea. He'll walk into the other side of the lake. Mind you, Jesus, the Son of God, the fullness of God in, veil, in the veil of flesh, Jesus can walk in the middle of the night to be unseen and to go to the other side of the lake, miraculously walking on water. It, because the passage of Scripture show you that he's not going straight to the boat. He's just passing by. Now the, the disciples say, uh, uh, crying, oh, it is a ghost. It is a spirit. Because they were still superstitious in the people of Israel that were ghosts, but they know about demons and devils, but uh, of ghosts, that superstition that came from the Greeks and other pagan cultures. Now, Mind you, Jesus now reassures them that he is not a spirit, that he is not a ghost. He says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. This expression, fear not, do not fear, be not afraid, is found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Whenever there's a supernatural appearance of an angel, of the angel of God, which is basically the pre-incarnate form of the Lord Jesus Christ in a visible manner, or it is the Son of God himself in the flesh, is always being said, do not fear. For humans we that are born in sin, we fear which is spiritual. We fear that comes from heaven. And now the apostles were in, in fear because now they see their master, their rabbi, their teacher, the healer, walking on water. Now. Jesus reassures them, do not be afraid. It is me. Now Peter said, if it is you, as you say you are, let me go to you. Let me walk on water. And Jesus told him, come. In Hebrew, the word come means both. Means come. And then Peter started walking on water. But the Bible said that when he started looking at the water, the storm boisterous, that means loud and strong and threatening, Peter was imbued with fear, uh, he started to sink. And then he asked the Lord, save me. 
And Jesus grabbed them by the arm and he pulled him out of the water, bring him into the ship. And he said, oh, thou of little faith. Why or wherefore didst thou doubt? There's a relationship between faithful, believing, and not fearing, and the disbelief and the lack of faith. There's a very close relationship with these terms. Let me explain. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 21, when there was a, the, uh, the event that the apostles tried to exorcise a demon out of a child, a devil out of a child, the devil did not come. Jesus had to come and save the boy's life. For the disciples were not able to exorcise the demon. Jesus was able, of course, to exorcise the demon. And then the apostles privately asked him why we were not able to cast out the devil. And Jesus said, because of your disbelief. But by the disbelief of the disciples of Christ, they did miracles. They healed, they cast out devils. They preached the word of God, the first 12 and then the, the, the 70. In the name of Jesus, they did all that. And they brought Jesus a good report. But then in this case, they are not able to exercise that devil out of the boy. Jesus said that was their disbelief. I think they were afraid of that devil, whatever it was, that causing them a disbelief. And they were not able to take it out. But then Jesus said, only this kind of devil or this kind of demon this kind of evil spirit only comes out by fasting and prayer and we're talking about 12 disciples that try to exercise this devil out of the boy and were not able they ne they needed to fast they needed to pray because spirits just like human beings there are human beings that are stronger than others others feeble and others stronger others taller or they're faster others smarter in the spirit world, I assume the same. There are ranks and authorities and powers. So therefore, this devil was more powerful than the others ones they encountered. They needed to be fasting. They need to be prayer. That their faith will be strengthened. Not the body, but their faith. And because of the disbelief, the lack of faith, they were not able to take that devil away. Everything goes together of the hand. They have seen Jesus do miracles. They have Jesus, they have seen Jesus turn water into wine in Cana. They have seen Jesus feed thousands two times with bread and fishes. They have seen when the Lord told them, uh, cast your net in, not on this side, but this side, and the, and the next field. They have seen Jesus resurrect dead, like the uh, son of the widow of, of, uh, of Nain, uh, and Lazarus, his friend, and all the people he rose from the dead. They have seen Jesus do all those things, and yet they have an issue with their faith. In the case of these storms, I believe, that's my personal opinion, that Satan and the devil caused these storms in order to destroy Jesus and the apostles. But that didn't work because Jesus got authority of all the universe. And the earth and the powers and the forces that govern them. Yet the apostles struggle with their belief, they struggle with their faith, and that's why Jesus rebuked them. Oh, you a little faith. Why didn't you believe? See, it is important that the believer, the disciple of Christ, who want to live like Christ, must believe. Remember that we always say in church and when we always preach the gospel that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth, believeth, and I will say it again, believeth in him shall, shall not perish but have everlasting life. In order to attain everlasting life or eternal life, you have to believe that Jesus is come of the Father, that He came in the flesh, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Savior, that He is the Messiah. If we believe 
we obtain eternal life by our faith, by our belief in Jesus. And Jesus said also that if we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, and I have seen the mustard seed in my own hand, they're very, very tiny. So tiny, but if you put it on the ground, let it grow, it turns into a huge tree. Jesus said that we have the grain of a mustard seed. We can tell the mountains to move out of the way or to be cast into the sea, and it will happen. Because for God, nothing is impossible, for God is the creator. And we are his children. Jesus is telling us to fortify, to strengthen our faith by believing in him, by believing in his works, by believing in his name, by believing that he is the son of God, by believing that he is the savior and that we walk by faith. Regardless if there's a physical storm or there's a spiritual storm or emotional storm or social storm or world war, earthquakes, pestilences, you name it. We have to live by faith. This also come to my mind. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 8. After Jesus uh, said the parable of the unjust judge that avenges a woman. Because she was so persistent, persistent. And this uh, judge did not believe it, did not fear God or man. But because this woman asked for justice, this judge made sure that the woman was avenged. Jesus said in a Luke 18 8, when the Son of Man cometh, Jesus is there, he came to the earth, right? He came to visit Israel. He came to assess Israel. He came to preach the gospel, to give his life for the remission of sins of the whole world. But also Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, that he's talking about his second coming, his second advent. He said, shall he find faith on earth? Mind you, he already has apostles and disciples after him, with him. But he's saying that in the future, there might be a case that there might be almost very little faith on earth. And he's making a reference, indirect reference, to the last days, to the end times, the very same times we're living right now. Now, what is faith? Right? I, I said the title, Keep Your Faith from Shipwreck. We're talking about these two instances that the apostles almost shipwrecked literally in, in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus saved them. He calmed the storm and he rebuked them for their lack of faith. And we see that their ship did not shipwreck because Jesus was with them. He was for them. And even when the second time when he was walking away, he came into the boat and saved them. We know that part. Faith. In the New Testament, according to the Strong's Concordance, the word in Greek is pistis. And pistis means faith, faithfulness, belief, confidence, fidelity, and also a guarantee. A guarantee. And the word pistis comes from patho, which means to persuade or to be persuaded. In order for you to be faithful, to have faithfulness, to have belief, to have a confidence in the guarantee, you have to be persuaded. You have to obtain a persuasion. So in, in the context of the Greek scriptures and the Gospels, we can tell that always, and it's going to be always, that faith is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God always and never, and never is something that can be produced by people. I will repeat this again. Faith is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In other words, for us, the believer in Jesus Christ, for us Christians, born again believers, faith is God's persuasion. And we got the guarantee from God himself who cannot lie. He's no man that he will lie. He's always truthful. We are assured, we are confident that what God has done, is doing, and will do, is certain and faithful. 
and God will never fail. Now, concerning faith and shipwrecks, how can we avoid a shipwreck in our faith? Not in a physical storm, but in the many problems we're facing in our lives, in our families, in our own health, in our own mind, in our workplace, in the world, in our own country, as the madness and the evil and the wickedness of this world is encroaching in the church, is encroaching in our families, how can we keep our faith from shipwreck? Well, there are three points that we must abide by. We must ponder, we must meditate it. The first one, we must abound in faith. The second, we must avoid the shipwrecks of our faith. And third, we have to be careful and to repent immediately. The first point, we must abound in faith. Paul wrote to the disciple Timothy in his first letter, according to chapter 1, verse 14, the following words. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So the grace of God, which is in Christ Jesus, has to be abundant and exceeding abundant with faith and love. So we know that Jesus said many times, the one who loves the most forgives the most. And the one who is forgiven the most will love the most. We have been forgiven from all our sins. Even the sin of Adam that causes death. The sin of Eve that causes pain. We have been forgiven. And we are given. And we, have, we are recipients of the gift of eternal life. Therefore, Paul is telling to Timothy. And he's also telling to us, the church of the 21st century. That we must abound in grace. The grace of our Lord. With faith. So our faith must be abundant. In love, in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, if a little grain of mustard, a faith like a grain of mustard can move a mountain out of its place and cast it into the sea, how much more a faith that is abundant in you, in your family, in the house of worship, and in the world? Nothing can be possible for the believer who believes by faith in the grace of God in the love of God, and in the everlasting gospel of the Lord. Paul told us to abound in love and faith, in, which is in Christ Jesus, by the grace of God. We must do. So we must be abundant in the faith. Verse 15 and 16, Paul keeps uh, saying, this is a faithful saying, faithful, faith, right? Certain, assured. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How bait for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for pattern to them we should hereafter believe, believe on him to life everlasting. So believe leads to everlasting life in Jesus Christ. We must understand that we are saved not by works, not by rituals, not by waters and, and, and incenses or punishments. We are saved by the grace and the mercy of the Father through Christ Jesus by our faith in Him. And we must abound in faith and love, as it is said. For we are recipients of the everlasting life gift. That's the first thing we must do to keep our faith from shipwreck. We must abound in faith. You have to add coal to a fire to keep the fire going. The more coal, the bigger the fire. We must increase in faith. We must have a, a close relationship to the Father through Christ Jesus by prayer. How good is your prayer life? How many times do you pray? How is the quality of your prayers with the Lord? Do you fall asleep? Do you find it boring? Do you find find it 
edifying or not? Do you go by the feeling that God is listening or not? Or do you go by knowing and by the assurance and the guarantee that God hears your prayers as long as it is in the name of Jesus, by faith? How is your Bible study? How are you studying and reading the scriptures, trying to understand the scripture and asking the Father for knowledge, for wisdom, for insight and wisdom? Okay, God will give all this to you if you ask by faith. But you have to have a, a strong spiritual connection with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Ghost through Christ Jesus. And you have to study the Word of God, meditating the Word of God, applying your daily life and sharing it. Share the gospel with somebody else. Your salvation needs to be heard your testimony needs to be heard by others they need to know how to get saved from the wrath of the father that is coming your testimony is essential but more essential is the gospel which is found in the holy bible and you need to adhere to it you need to understand it day and night you have to read a little bit here a little bit there find a way or we can help you but we cannot study for you we cannot pray Uh, for you so I cannot intercede for you in that manner for Jesus is the only mediator between God and, uh, and man Jesus is the only intercessor between God and man I can pray for you but I cannot uh, my, my prayer is not Jesus All right. so keep a strong and healthy spiritual relationship with the Father through the Son Okay, the second point that we must ponder is that we must avoid shipwrecks in our faith, just like the Titanic. If you remember, not the movie, but the actual ship, the Titanic, the HMS Titanic built in England, was built so strong according to the technology of the time, it was supposed to be uh, unsinkable. Even the creator of the and the designer of the Titanic said these words not even God will sink the ship. But guess what? The statement that he did is blasphemous because God can do whatever he wants. And, and the moment this ship, the Titanic, hit an iceberg, it sank. All right? The Titanic shipwrecked because the captain and the crew were not paying close attention that where they were navigating, there were icebergs in the middle of the night. They were not paying close attention to their navigation. They were so overconfident that their ship will Uh, endure anything that it will not sink and it did sink and thousands of people died mind you look at this we must avoid this attitude of overconfidence in our skills and our prayer life to be confident that we are uh, in, a, in a good standard with God because even Paul said he who believed that he's standing be careful lest you be swept away we got to be careful In the same letter of Timothy, in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, it reads, and I will read for you, right? Actually, from 18 to 20, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. He tells us to stay on the warfare, to be like good soldiers. We must fight the war of faith. And be conscious that we must remain in our training. 19 and 20. Holding faith. Holding faith. And a good conscience. Which some having put away concerning faith. Have made shipwreck. Of whom Emmanuel and Alexander. Whom I have delivered unto Satan. That they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul is telling Timothy to wage the spiritual war of war, uh, spiritual war of faith. Timothy was considered as a son by Paul. He was of importance to Paul. This is a young man, half Greek, half Jew. And yet, the Lord used Timothy to found churches, to minister to churches to supervise the churches, to visit them. And Paul was encouraging Timothy that although he is relatively young compared to others, he must stand in faith, to hold on to faith. Hold the faith, like holding tight so nobody will take it from you. And to have a good conscience. 
good conscience according to God in Christ Jesus. When you know that you're born again of the water and of the spirit, just like Jesus said in, Ma in, in John 4 and 3, when you know that your faith is accepted by God because you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you have forsaken the things of the world. I have denied yourself, picked up your own course, and follow him daily. You can be assured that the Lord will keep you, that the Lord will protect you, that the Lord will save you. He may, you may, he may not erase your troubles. He may leave those trials and temptations in your way, but your test of your faith will remain successful, will remain strong because you're walking by faith. And uh, you're conscious that you need to feed your faith. You need to feed your faith with prayer. You need to feed your faith with praises. To gather in church, in holy worship. To encourage one another, as uh, Paul said, even more so that the day is approaching. What day? The day of the rapture is approaching. The day of the revelation of Jesus Christ to his bride to catch up his church unto himself in the middle middle of the air according to first Thessalonians and first uh, Corinthians that we are soon to be gathered in the Lord our faith must be stronger must remain uh, fervent must be uh, uh, alive if you will because we understand that the times and seasons are changing, that the prophecies of the Bible are being fulfilled. And once the Lord says, the preaching of the gospel is enough, in all the nations the end shall come, he will catch us up in the air. We'll be raptured and we'll be gathered unto the Lord, according to John chapter 14. Therefore, our faith is certain. But don't let us. Be like Hermeneus and Alexander that were blaspheming. Whatever they were saying was a blasphemy against the Lord. And Paul delivered them on to Satan. We cannot be like them. We cannot fall away. Because the Bible prophesied that there will be a great falling away. A great apostasy of the church in the last days. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This falling away, we can see it. Look at your church if you go to church. Look at our churches if we go to churches. The majority of the faithful are still there, but compared before the pandemic, as I say, has decreased exponentially. Many people don't want to be in church, don't want to come to church. They are satisfied with just watching a little Zoom meeting, a little Facebook or YouTube uh, video. And that's it. That's all there is. When Paul said, do not forsake of assembling yourselves together. I'll talk about that in a minute. We must hold fast, hold our faith, and to have a good conscience with the Lord. And concerning faith, we cannot let it go to shipwreck. We must know, Paul said, we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. According to Ephesians chapter 6, we must put on the armor of God that will be able to stand the devil and his wiles and his attacks. We know his devices. He uses our senses, the loss of the eye, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's the same thing that he offered Jesus. That's the same thing he offered Adam. Adam failed. Jesus succeeded. And we overcome because Jesus overcame the devil. Jesus overcame the world. And no fault was found on him. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, Paul explains that faith is the substance. It's a concrete thing. It's the substance of things hoped for. We are holding on to eternal life. We're holding on to the coming of Christ for the rapture. We're holding on to the day of judgment. We're holding on to... The, the, the resurrection of the day. We are holding on to the coming of the new earth and the new heaven. We are holding on to the new Jerusalem where Jesus will reign from forever and ever. We are holding on that even now in the times of persecution as so much evil against Christianity, against the Christian church, we can hold on to our faith and not dismay. That no matter how strong and loud the winds and the roars of the waters of this evil 
coming at the church, we can sleep assured that the Lord sleeps with us. He stands for us. He stands guard for us. He intercedes for us. He mediates for us. He encourages us. But we must walk by faith. Believing and not fall into the disbelief or to be complacent that just a sample service is enough for God because I already was saved about 20 years ago or 10 years ago or one year ago and I'm just attending service once every month or, or, or reading a passage of scripture every now and then or praying in your house one or two times a month. That's not enough. You have to hold on to your faith for the rapture is drawing near. For the rapture is drawing near. And the third point is, be very careful and repent now. If you're doing things, you're sinning against God. Uh, you know you were born again. Uh, you know you were purchased by Christ, by the blood of Christ. Uh, you know you're sinning against God. Your faith is sinking. You are sinking into worse condition than before you were saved. And look at the warning from... Uh, from... Uh, 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 the Apostle Paul, right here in Hebrews, we're going to Hebrews, and time is approaching quick for me to make an end. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. Paul said, if we sin willfully, if we sin willfully, that means knowing that sin is wrong because we were saved by Christ already. We were delivered from sin, death, hell, and the lake of fire, and we are appointed to eternal life by Christ Jesus. Paul said, if we sin willfully, that means we knowingly, After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the gospel, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That means the blood of Christ will not cover you. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fire indignation from whom? From God, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died with a mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishes, punishment, how much sorer punishment. Suppose ye that he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. If you sin willfully, in other words, you have trampled on the holy blood of Christ. And the holy blood of Christ, you trample on and you treat it as an unholy thing. That it is nothing. I can sin and get forgiveness later. I can keep sinning and get forgiveness later. I just need to say, God, I'm sorry. Be mindful. Because Paul is warning that according to the law of Moses, if you committed adultery or you committed uh, idolatry, or fornication, or if you even blaspheme or said a bad joke against the name of God. If two people hear you, three people hear you, or so you do it, you die according to the law of Moses. How much more that Jesus, who is the Son of God, gave his life for the sins of all the world, and we're going to treat his covenant, his new covenant, that he purchased us, the church, with his own blood. We're going to try uh, treat our relationship with Jesus, our salvation with Jesus, his precious blood as nothing. That's the worst shipwreck ever because there's no salvation. Jesus is not going to come a second time and die for you. For a, a terrible punishment is coming. A dreadful judgment is coming. For God will treat you as an adversary, as an enemy, as a devil. I, a Satan means adversary. If you are born again believer, you start sinning willfully against God. God will see you as his own enemy, as, as the devil. And he will give you the punishment the devil will receive. Do you understand? Verse 30, for we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge, God will judge the church and the people of Israel before anybody. Paul said that judgment starts in the house of the living God. The judgment of God starts in the house of God. In the, if the church can barely stand, how much less the world. Verse 31 says, it is the fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you want to know how God can be severe, read the first five books of the Bible, the book of Joshua, the book of jo uh, Judges, the first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, 
first, second Samuel. See how God treated his people. When they were faithful to God, God blessed them and increased them exponentially and gave them safety and salvation from his enemies. But when they started sinning against God, God poured not just that the enemies overtake him and overcome them and make him suffer. God will pour out his wrath on them. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If we sin against God willfully, there's no Jesus to save us. Jesus will step away. He will say, you trample my blood that I gave you for your salvation. So don't shipwreck in your faith. Do not blaspheme against the covenant, the new covenant, against the blood of Christ by your behavior. We walk by faith, not by sight. Let me uh, make uh, the three points again. Our faith is based on the God's persuasion. We have the confidence and we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that we receive eternal life, and therefore we share this beautiful news of the gospel with everybody. We must keep a close relationship with God through prayer, uh, fasting, uh, praises, supplication, and especially we must hear the word of God. We must assemble, we must gather ourselves physically in the church in the same place, and Encourage one another to stay faithful to God until the day approaches, the day of the rapture approaches. We must abound our faith. We must increase exceedingly in faith and love. Jesus said we must love God with all our minds, our body, our hearts, our strength, and love our neighbor as yourself. Jesus said the world will know that you are many disciples if you love one another. We must avoid the sheep wrecks of our faith we must hold fast to our faith holding to our faith and a good conscience and do not be and don't put away these things because our faith will shipwreck because god will deliver us to satan and the other point will be be very careful and repent immediately if you sin against god god will forgive your sins if you confess them but don't do this a habit. Don't do this a habit. For there's no more forgiveness of sin. There will be a, 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 a terrible thing. Because God is a terrible God. He's a loving God. He's God and Almighty. He's long-suffering. But God is holy. Then God is righteous. And God doesn't change. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. And you were appointed to salvation. Why are you going to jeopardize your salvation for your lack of faith? Even if the whole church departs from the faith and start doing abominations and start doing the things of the world that God told us not to do, homosexuality, idolatry, witchcraft, all that mess, and, and the whole church departs and leave you alone in the building, that's fine. you there. Then there's one, two, two, three in my name. Jesus says I'm in the midst of them. Even if you feel you're alone by faith, you understand that God is encamped around you with millions and millions of angels protecting you. Then the Holy Ghost, which dwells in you, will give you clarity, will keep your mind right, will keep your conscience right, will keep your faith strong, and your love for the Father strong, and will keep you will keep preaching the gospel to the very end until the Lord calls you home. Our Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, which I love, Jesus, when he was addressing the church of Philadelphia, he says, I know that works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. Actually, faith is also related to strength. What strength? Spiritual strength. For thou hast a little faith, and hast kept my word. What word? The gospel, the holy Bible. And has not denied my name. The Christian of the 21st century must remain Christian, must Believe in the name of Jesus Christ, must proclaim the name of Jesus Christ as he is the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. We must abide by the word of God and defend the word of God whenever possible. And not to be apologetic. I'm not apologetic to defending the word of God, even if it costs my life or my neck. It doesn't matter, for I will defend the name of Christ regardless. Because God said through Jesus that he believes in me and dies shall live. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, when uh, also said, Because thou, he's talking to the church of Philadelphia, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. I will keep you from the hour of temptation. I repeat that again. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation that shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. In other words, Jesus is telling us, Oh, the church of the 21st century, praise God, I'm part of it. 
and part of the church that we have kept the word of his patience, that we have a little strength, that we have a little faith. When Jesus comes, when he asks rhetorically, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on earth? He will find a little group of faithful, a remnant of the church, if you will, that will remain faithful, uh, preaching the gospel and loving one another and waiting on the coming of the Lord. Jesus will see that there's a few. And Jesus says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. To the church of Smyrna, Jesus says, fear none of these things, the things that will befall on the world. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Yes, the faithful remnant of the church that will remain here, uncorrupted by faith, walking by faith and not by sight, will be persecuted. Jesus prophesied already, and will be put in prison, prison that we might be tried. That, and we shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful. There goes faith again. Be, be thy faithful unto earth, and I will give you the crown of life. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. That we'll receive the crown of life. Even if we lose our life. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. We must hear the word of God. So we can strengthen our faith. And our love of God and our brethren. And share the gospel. This good news with others. We cannot remain quiet. We cannot remain neutral. We cannot remain in the sidelines. We must be active in the ministry of the gospel unto the world. We must remain faithful in our Lord and Savior. To whatever cost. To whatever end. We got the guarantee from God the Father. Through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We live forever. And no matter what we go through right now, we must stay abundant in faith and grace through Christ Jesus and to avoid the conditions that make our faith shipwreck and to be warned to the righteous, not to fall off from the righteousness of God and the holiness of God and fall into the ways of the world, but to remain until the coming of Christ. The rewards for the faithful are indescribable. When I read the Bible and I read the rewards for the faithful and the punishment for the unbeliever, I wonder how much God loves me and loves you. Walk by faith, not by faith, not by sight. Don't worship God or pray to God to be seen by people. Don't give gifts to be seen by other people. Don't post it on Facebook or whatever you want to do. Be humble. Share the love of God. Come to church. The time is almost up for the church to go home, home to heaven in the rapture. Don't be left behind. I supplicate you. Don't be left behind. When and how is on God's uh, prerogative. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and we walk by faith to whatever ends. So this is the class for today. The end is at hand. We are in the last days. And therefore, we must make sure of our salvation. And we must stand by faith because Jesus will reward his faithful and punish the unbelievers. Are you, on, are you in the boat with Christ? Are you experiencing storms in your life? Some people are going through worse things and remain faithful because they have set their eyes on Christ alone. They know the storms are there. They know the troubles and the temptations and the trials and the persecutions and the, and the things that are happening in their health and in their families and even in the church. They know But they keep their eyes on Jesus. I keep my eyes on Jesus, not on the storm. He will see us through. All right? Until the next one, stay focused on Christ. Walk by faith, not by sight.